the 18th Sunday after Trinity. Lord, we beseech thee, grant thy people grace to withstand the temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil, and with pure hearts and minds to follow thee. Cause us to think and to feel things that are good and that we may be fruitful through the merits and the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Verse 1 of hymn 181, an Easter hymn. Awake and sing the song of Moses and of the Lamb. Wake every heart and every tongue to praise the Savior's name. Well, we turn now to Professor Archibald Alexander Hodges, commentary on the Westminster Confession of Faith. Um, largely, we like it. We don't like the fact that he doesn't quote the Bible verses except in his little footnotes at the bottom, thereby implying his comments are more important than the Bible itself. And then also making a statement that these things can be found here rather than in the commentary. So we've noted that before, we noted again. One of the things we like about Professor Robert Raymond's systematic theology is that he quotes the Bible. And I'd say the same with Professor Wayne Grudem. And uh, Anybody who'd say, well, that would make the book too long. So, have three, four volumes. What's the, what's the problem here? So, we're on chapter six of the fall of man and sin and the punishment thereof. Our first parents being seduced by the subtlety and temptation of Satan. Sin and eating the forbidden fruit. Footnotes, Genesis 3.13. 2 Corinthians 11, 3. This their sin God was pleased, according to his wise and holy counsel, to permit, having purposed to order it for his own glory. Romans 11, 32, that of God, through God, by God, all things happen. Through his, through his wisdom, for whatever purposes he had. God having brought the souls of Adam and Eve into a being by immediate creation, holy and with sufficient, this is Hodge now, with sufficient knowledge as to his will, capable of obedience yet fallible. This section proceeds to teach that they sinned. That particular sin they committed was their eating the forbidden fruit. Three, that they were seduced thereto by the subtlety and temptation of Satan. That this sin was permissively embraced in the sovereign purpose of God. And in so doing, God designed in order to his own glory. Our first parents sinned. This particular sin they committed was their eating the forbidden fruit. It appears to be God's general plan and one eminently wise and righteous. <coughs> all the created subjects of moral government into a state of probation for a time in which he makes their permanent character and destiny depend upon their own action. He creates them holy yet capable of falling. In this state, he subjects them to a moral test for a time. If they stand the test, the reward is that their moral characters are confirmed and rendered infallible. And they are introduced into an inalienable blessedness forever. If they fail, they are judicially excluded from God's favor and communion forever, and hence morally and eternally dead. This has certainly been his method of dealing with new created angels and men. In the case of mankind, the specific test to which our first parents were subjected was their abstaining from eating of the fruit of a single tree. As this was a matter in itself morally indifferent, it was admirably adapted to be the test 
of their implicit allegiance to God of their absolute faith and submission. The dreadful sin which they committed in eating this fruit appears from the indications afforded in the record of Genesis to have been one unbelief. They were induced to doubt the wisdom of the divine prohibition and the certainty of divine threatening. Disobedience, they said, the effect of the origin of sin in this world, there are two questions which men constantly ask and which it is impossible to answer. <clears throat> How could sinful volitions or desires originate in the soul of moral agents created wholly like Adam and Eve? Men exercise choice according to their prevailing desires and affections. If these are holy, their wills are holy. And the character of their prevailing affections and desire is determined by the moral state of their souls. If their souls are holy, these are holy. If their souls are sinful, these are sinful. Christ says a good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. Matthew 12, 33 and 35. But Adam's heart had been created holy, how then could his action be sinful? All our experience conspires to make the question more difficult. The sinful souls of fallen men never give birth to holy volitions until they are regenerated by grace. The holy spirits of angels and glorified men in heaven are forever removed from all liability to sinful affections or actions. In both these cases, the stream continues as the fountain. The holy soul of Adam, it is plain that the difficulty lies only in our ignorance. We have none of us experienced the same conditions of free agencies as those which give character to the case of Adam. We've always been under bondage of corruption, except in so far as we are momentarily assisted against nature by supernatural grace. Now, in order that a volition shall be holy, it must spring from a positively holy affection or disposition. And as these are not native to our hearts, we cannot exercise holy volitions without grace. But Adam was in a state of probation, holy, yet fallible. Saints and holy angels are holy and infallible. Yet their infallibility is not essential to their natures, but is a superadded divine grace sustained by the direct power of God. While holiness must always be positive, rooting itself in divine love, it is plain that sin may originate in defect, not in positive alienation but in want of watchfulness in the contemporary ascendancy of the natural and innocent appetites of the body or constitutional tendencies of the soul over the higher powers of conscience. The motives, objective or subjective, which appear to have led to this dreadful sin in the case of our first parents were not intrinsically sinful, but became so when dwelt upon and allowed gradually to occupy the mind and sway the will in spite of the divine prohibition. There were natural appetite for attractive fruit, natural desire for knowledge, the persuasive power of the superior mind and will of Satan. And this last fact, the third, they were seduced thereto by the subtlety of Satan, much of the solution to this mystery lies. To the fall of Satan and his angels in the remote past and under conditions of which we have no knowledge, 
the true origin of sin is to be referred. The other element of mystery with regard to the origin of sin relates to the permission of God. This section affirms the fourth, that this sin was permissively embraced in the eternal counsel of God. About the facts of the case, there can be no doubt. God did certainly foreknow that if such a being as Adam was put in such conditions as he would, he would sin as he sinned. Yet in spite of this certain knowledge, God created that very being and put him in those very conditions. And having determined to overrule the sin for good, he sovereignly decreed not to intervene to prevent. And he made it certainly future. On the other hand, God did neither cause nor approve Adam's sin. He forbade it and prevented motives which would have deterred from it. He created Adam holy and fully capable of obedience and with sufficient knowledge of his duty and left him alone to his trial. If it be asked why God, who abhors sin, and who benevolently desires the excellence and happiness of his creatures, should, be, should sovereignly determine to permit such a fountain of pollution, degradation, and misery to be opened, we can only say with profound reverence, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. That God from the beginning designed to order the sin of Adam to his own glory is included in what we've already proved in the chapters on creation and providence. That God overrules the sins of creation. So that over the sin, I'm sorry, the sins of his creatures for good. But the chief end of all God's purposes and works is the manifestation of his own glory. Section two, by this sin, they fell from their original righteousness and communion with God. Genesis 3, 6 to 8. Ecclesiastes 7, uh, 12, 29, sorry. Romans 3, 23. And so became dead in sin. Genesis 2, 17. Ephesians 2, 1 and wholly defiled in all the faculties and parts of soul and body. Titus 1.15, Jeremiah 6.5, Jeremiah 17.9, Romans 3.10-18. This section teaches what were the consequences of the first sin upon its immediate authors. In doing so, it affirms that by this sin, they were immediately cut off from communion with God. And consequently, they lost their original righteousness. At the same time, they became dead in sin and wholly defiled. Fourth, that this moral corruption extended to all faculties and parts of body and soul. As a natural being, uh, as a natural being depends upon the same sustaining power of God that providentially sustains all things in being. <clears throat> but as a moral and religious being, he depends upon the intimate and loving communion of God's spirit for spiritual grace and consequently for a right and moral state of action. By this sin, man must have instantly cut off from this loving communion of the divine spirit. This must have been under any constitution, the natural effect of sin. And under that covenant relation into which man had been introduced to the gracious providence of God and his creation, it was specifically provided that the commission of the forbidden act should be followed by instant death. That is instant penal exclusion from the source of all moral and spiritual life, Genesis 2.17. Hence, secondly, the principle of spiritual life having been withdrawn as the punishment of that first sin, 
our parents must have instantly lost their in original righteousness. Their allegiance had been violated, their faith broken, and love could no long, longer dominate in their hearts. And hence, third, they must at once become corrupt in sins and wholly corrupt. And fourth, this corruption must extend to all the faculties. It is not meant that Adam, by his one sin, became, became as bad as man can be, or as he himself became afterwards. But as death at the heart involves death in all its members, so the favor and communion of God being lost, original righteousness, the necessary principle of obedience is lost. Adam's apostasy from God is complete. God demands perfect obedience, and Adam is now a rebel. A schism was introduced into his soul. Conscience uttered its condemning voice. This leads to fear, distrust, prevarication, and an endless series of sins. Thus his entire nature became depraved the will being at war with the conscience. The understanding became darkened, the passions roused, the affections alienated, the conscience callous or deceitful, the appetites of the body inordinate, and its members instruments of unrighteousness. Section three. They being the root of all mankind, the guilt of this sin was imputed. And the same sin in death and corrupted nature conveyed to all their posterity, descending from them by ordinary generation. Genesis 1, 27 and 8, 3, 16 and 17, Acts 17, 26, Romans 5, 12 through 21, 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22, 45 and 49. You see here where this should have been printed out. Psalm 51, 5, Genesis 5, 3, Job 14, 4, 15, 14, Romans 5, 6. 8, 7, 7, 18, Colossians 1, 21, Genesis 6, 5, oh, we're getting ahead of ourselves here, from this original corruption whereby we are utterly indisposed, disabled and made opposite to all good, and wholly inclined to all evil, do proceed actual transgressions. Genesis 6, 5, 8, 21, Romans 3, 10 through 12, James 1, 14 and 15, Ephesians 2, 2 and 3, Matthew 15, 19. And I'm almost wondering if instead of the way systematic theology was taught, at three seminaries where I was at, four actually, whether it could be taught by simply reading it as we're doing it, and then gathering up these verses and doing a reconnaissance tour, open the Bible, explain the context and the importance of the single text and how it bears back in relation to the Westminster Confession. Now we get Professor Hodge's commentary. These sections teach us what were the consequences of the first sin to the descendants of its authors. In doing so, our standards affirm that Adam was both the natural and federal head of all mankind. Confession, chapter 7, section 2, that's coming up. Uh, Larger Catechism questions 22, 25, and Shorter Catechisms questions 16 and 18 
that's another thing. I wish you had to put it in, in confessional standards. Somebody say, well, it makes it too long. So it's already 560 pages. Throw a few more books in there. And I'm also noticing here that we're, you know, Old Testament, New Testament, systematics, which this is systematics. We're not getting any church history here. The argument will be, well, yeah, but all you need is the Bible. No, you, you, the Bible's supreme. Nobody denied that. But we want to hear more than just Archibald's view. This is not a minor criticism. What's Augustine hold here? What's Pelagius hold? What about the Synod of Orange? What about Gottschalk? And so, Aquinas, Wycliffe, Luther, Calvin, Robert Bellarmine, the, the Jansenists, and so forth. So that the student gets a, a runny history of the doctrine of sin and how it's been viewed. What about the 39 articles? What about other confessions? So we are, this may be written just for Sunday school material, but we have, since when do we make assumptions that a Sunday school class can't learn church history? I'm a little old to start writing this stuff since I'm retired and out of the field, but Maybe some of the younger guys can pick it up. And consequently, the moral corruption which results from the penal withdrawing of God's Holy Spirit in the case of our first parents is necessarily conveyed to all of those of their descendants who are produced through ordinary generation. For this innate hereditary depravity of soul is total. For by it we are utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all good, and wholly inclined to evil. From this innate moral depravity proceed all subsequent actual transgressions. First, Adam was both the natural and federal head of all mankind. Christ, of course, accepted. The nature and provisions of that covenant which God made with Adam will be constantly in its appropriate place. Chapter 8. The point which demands our attention here is that in making the covenant with Adam, God constituted him and treated him as the moral representative of all his natural descendants. This is very explicitly taught in our standards, Confession, Chapter 8, Section 2. The first covenant made with man was a covenant of works, wherein life was promised to Adam and in him to his posterity, upon condition of perfect personal obedience. Larger catechism question. Well, good. Here we go. The covenant being made with Adam as a public person, not for himself only, but for all his posterity, all mankind descending from him by ordinary generation, sinned in him and fell with him in his first transgression. Shorter catechism of that beloved little thing. The covenant being made with Adam not only for himself, but for his posterity, all mankind descending from him by ordinary generation, sinned in him and fell with him in his first transgression. As we have seen, it is God's general method of dealing with new created moral agents to create them holy, yet capable of falling, and then put them on trial for a time making their confirmed and permanent moral character and destiny to depend upon their own action. In the case of the angels who were severally created independent individuals, they appear to have stood their trial severally, each in his own person. Some fell and some were confirmed in holiness and blessedness. 
but in the case of a race to be pro propagated in a series, each individual to come into existence an unintelligent infant, thence to develop gradually into a moral agency like that of mankind. It is obvious that one of the three plans must be adopted. The whole race must be confirmed in holiness and happiness without any probation. Each individual must stand in his own probation while groping his way from infancy to childhood. Or the whole race must have their trial in their natural head and root, Adam. We are not in a condition to judge of the propriety of the first of these plans, but we can easily see that the third is incomparably more rational, righteous, and merciful than the second. As a matter of fact, God did make our character and destiny to depend upon the conduct of Adam and his probation. This was right because his sovereign creator an infinitely wise, righteous, and merciful God, guardian of the interests of all his creatures, it seemed right in his eyes. Because it was more to our advantage than any other plan can be imagined, Adam was most advantageously constituted and circumstanced in order that he should stand the trial safely incalculable benefits as well as risks were suspended upon his action. If he had maintained his integrity for a limited period, all of his race would have been born into an indefeasible inheritance of glory. Here we will call it to an end. Verse 2. Sing of his dying love, his resurrection power. Sing how he intercedes above for those whose sins he bore. <clears throat> Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.